best for for uh, all the world. Uh, let us welcome uh, Sheikh Al Mu'tasim Saeed Al Mu'awli. Uh, I believe he is an author and religious uh, supervisor in Sultan Qaboos University. Uh, he is going to deliver a lecture on uh, spiritual fasting. At the same time, we'd like to thank Dr. Saeed for organizing this uh, lecture. Uh, this activity is really special, special lecture and different from the engineering uh, prospectus. Uh, and very much welcome, Sheikh Al Mu'tasim. And may I invite uh, Dr. Saeed to brief us uh, about the uh, lecturer today. Please, Dr. Saeed. Shukran, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Doctor uh, Salam, for the welcoming speech to uh, our guest, Doctor um, Sheikh Mahtasim. And uh, Inshallah, this, this actually this uh, lecture is maybe it is within the cultural season of the University of Nizwa. And uh, College of Engineering usually have done many activities during this cultural season. Uh, but mostly we are concentrating in our uh, field in uh, under engineering in disciplines. Uh, but because of Ramadan, so we, we thought that we also to give some opportunity for uh, this month this, uh, and um, try to get something. So we invited uh, Sheikh Al Mu'tasim. Uh, Sheikh Al Mu'tasim is, uh, of course, is very very well known in Oman. Uh, Sorry, I will just uh, accept the peoples for who has, uh, and, uh, okay. Uh, of course, Sheikh Mu'tazim is very well known in Oman, and um, he is the author of a series of Al-Mu'tamad, Al-Mu'tamad uh, series uh, books. Uh, it, it reaches now uh, around uh, seven, uh, seven parts, uh, and he's also, uh, if we go through his, uh, he have a rich CV, but we maybe we could not meet in this uh, small or uh, short uh, introduction. Uh, if we go uh, show in his on his pre brief uh, CV, his uh, his name is Al Mu'tasim bin Said bin Saif Al Maouli. He's graduated from Sultan Qaboos University, and his master he got a master degree from Birmingham University in 2016. <clears throat> he is an author of series of books in Arabic and English. Also, he has some uh, some books in English. He is working now in uh, Sultan Qaboos in uh, Center of Oman Studies, and he has also published many papers in journals and uh, international conferences. So we are again welcoming him in University of Nizwa, and also uh, welcome to our guests from outside university who came to benefit from this lecture and uh, we hope uh, we are sure not not only how we are sure that dr uh, sheikh Mu'tasim will give us a very rich lecture during this uh, nice days of ramadan uh, so uh, now uh, I mean, people are uh, fasting but also some people maybe uh, they are doing fasting just by uh, and, um, they, they, they found their parents. So we are going, uh, as, as you see, <clears throat> the title, we are going for the, uh, uh, the spirit of fasting. So we want to go beyond, beyond uh, the physical uh, meaning of uh, fasting, uh, which uh, Sheikh Mu'tas, inshallah, uh, will uh, enrich us in this uh, topic. And also uh, after that, we are going to open questions and answers uh, if you have some questions and answers and uh, we said that he have many publications he have some many books series of al mutamad and he was also he have one uh, one of this he translated one of this series uh, and he, he translated to english and also he have uh, some uh, another uh, book in english and uh, we don't want to spend your time on talking by us we'll uh, let uh, the floor or give the floor to uh sheikh Mu'tasim to uh, start his speech welcome to sheikh Mu'tasim and uh, please start bismillah assalamu uh, alaikum welcome uh, to you all and thank you for this generous introduction 
I feel humbled uh, to be part of this event and to be given this inter uh, introduction. I think you spent your time uh, for this introduction. There was no need to give such an introduction. Anyhow, as I said, I'm pleased to be part of this uh, event, insha'Allah ta'ala. What I'm going to deliver, I don't believe it is a rich lecture. Rather, it's uh, some thoughts that I thought it would be useful to exchange with you, insha'Allah ta'ala, today before afternoon. So I start with uh, saluting uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I would start with the name of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salat wa salam ala ashraf fi khalqillahi ajma'in. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi al-tayyidin al-tahirin. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan uqtafa atharahum ila yawm al-deen. In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. All praise belongs to Allah. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon our beloved, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and those who follow him rightly and correctly till the day of resurrection. First and foremost, I would like to salute you all with the salutation of peace, with the salutation of love, with the salutation of the people of paradise. Tahiyyatuhum yawma ilqawnahu salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The announced topic, as just been told to you by Engineer Saeed, would be about the spirit of fasting. So we want to go beyond the physical activities of fasting. We know we have the five pillars of Islam, and among them is fasting. So fasting is an important and indispensable pillar of Islam. So once Islam and once Iman is not complete, is not acceptable without performing this great pillar of Islam. And um, it has been a great pillar of Islam by a famous narration of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, narrated to us by the great companion Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, who said, I heard the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Bunya al-Islam ala khams. Islam has been built upon five pillars. And he mentioned shahadat wa la ilaha illallah, wa anna muhammad al-rasulullah, wa iqamu al-salah, wa ita'u al-zakah, wa sawmu ramadhan, wa haggu al-bayt. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, here mentioned the five pillars of Islam. That is the testimony. The first pillar being the testimony that is, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. This is the first pillar. Then, iqamu salah, the observance and the establishment of prayer, wa ita'u zakah, giving zakah. Fasting Ramadan and the pilgrimage to the house of Allah in Mecca, al mukarraman So fasting the month of Ramadan is then one of the great pillars of Islam. It's an obligation upon every single Muslim who meet the requirements, who meet the conditions of obligations to be an adult, to be sane, to be capable of doing this. Otherwise, when if he doesn't meet these requirements, these conditions of obligations, he is not obliged to fast the month of Ramadan. And that is in itself another topic. So fasting the month of Ramadan is not about hunger, is not about physical hunger, it is not about physical thirst. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he commanded us to fast the month of Ramadan, he didn't want to see us starve out of hunger and starve out of thirst. He didn't want from us just to abstain from eating and drinking from the rise of dawn till the sunset. That is not the ultimate purpose of fasting. Rather, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see the piety of the heart, wants to 
purify our souls and our hearts before purifying our bodies. Yes, fasting has spiritual benefits. And fasting, yes, has also physical benefits, has body benefits. And this is crystal clear when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said to us in a narration reported by Imam Al-Rabi' ibn Habib, may Allah be pleased with him, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was quoted as saying, Sumu tasahum. Fast, perform fasting, you get fit. You get fit and you get healthy. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, here is telling us one of the physical benefits of fasting. But beside these physical benefits of fasting, beside the physical benefits of prayer, of uh, of going to pilgrimage and so on and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for, in, for us to achieve also spiritual goals, spiritual benefit, to achieve spiritual purpose. And this is the spirit of fasting, the title of today's discussion, as it was suggested by our uh, brother, uh, Mohandis uh, Engineer Saeed. The topic should be the spirit of fasting in order for us to go beyond the physical activities of fasting. And um, the obligations before embarking on this beautiful journey of elaborating on the benefits of fasting, spiritual benefits of fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has before that honored this obligation, this great pillar of Islam fasting, by making the month of Ramadan the time period in which we conduct this pillar of Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he obliged for us to fast, to fast 30 days, he didn't choose any time. He chose the best month of the year. That is the month of Ramadan. Uh, so the month of Ramadan is the best month for fasting. It was choosing the, must, the best of the month during the year in which the reward of the good deeds are greatly multiplied and magnified. In fact, in one narration of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was quoted as saying that anyone who makes or performs an obligation during this month it is as if he has performed 70 obligation in any other month. And the one who performs uh, one voluntary act, it is as if he has conducted or performed an obligation in the rest of the month. So the best of the month is the month of Ramadan. That's why fasting was honored to be on this particular or in this particular month. And this particular month, the month of Ramadan, also was greatly honored by being the time place for the revelation of the Holy Quran. The Quran was first revealed during the month of Ramadan or at a particular night, the night of decree or the night of Al-Qadr, the night of decree or night of predestination. The Holy Quran was revealed in this particular month. So it is an honor for this month. And this is crystal clear in the Holy Quran when the Almighty says, شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states that the Holy Quran was revealed in this month the verse reads in English, the month of Ramadan is that in which the Quran was revealed. Hudan linnas, guidance for people, guidance for mankind. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ And clear guidance and clear proofs of guidance and criterion. So the Holy Quran, besides it being guidance, it is also a criterion that distinguishes between truth and falsehood. And this takes me to one of the virtuous acts during the month of Ramadan. In fact, it is a virtuous act in any other month also, but it is greatly emphasized in this particular month 
because it is not only the month of fast, it is true the month of fast, it is true it is the month of the dua, it is the month also of the Holy Quran. So we are highly encouraged to recite the Holy Quran in this month. And there is a, practic a practical sunnah reported to us authentically to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In the authentic narration, it was reported that the angel Gabriel would come to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, every night during this month of Ramadan. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would read the entire Quran, what was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would read it, imagine, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would read the entire Quran to whom? To the angel, Gabriel, alayhi uh, salam, to the angel, Gabriel, alayhi salatu wassalam, until it was the year in one after which the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away, the Prophet, peace be upon him, departed our uh, world, the angel Gabriel came to him and the Prophet read the Quran to the angel Gabriel twice, not only once. So it is a practical sunnah from our role model. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to read the Quran at least once. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, read the Quran to the angel Gabriel twice, not only once. So it is a practical sunnah to emulate the way of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to read the Quran at least once or even twice. If we are truly believers in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and in his messagehood, we need then to follow in his footsteps by reciting the Holy Quran. And it's worth saying here that the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he revealed the Holy Quran, he didn't want from us just to chant the verses of the Holy Quran, to just recite the verses from the Holy Quran without contemplation. This is the ultimate goal of reciting the Holy Quran. This is the purpose of us reciting the Holy Quran, is to contemplate upon its verses. It is to ponder on its ayat, the ayat al-muhkamat, the clear ayat of the Holy Quran, is to reflect over the Holy Quran what commandments are there for us to follow in the Holy Quran, what prohibitions are there in the Holy Quran to avoid. And only by doing so, and only by doing so, we will be a truly readers and reciters of the Holy Quran because this is the purpose of reciting the Holy Quran and this is not a secret to the one of us who recite the Holy Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this fact clear to any of us who read the Holy Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran stating and clarifying the purpose of him revealing the Holy Quran when he says, كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ وَلْيَتَذَكَّرَ أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ This is a blessed book revealed to you, O Muhammad. This is a blessed book revealed to you, O Muhammad. لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ In order for them to contemplate upon its verses, وَلْيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ And it, it might be a reminder for those of understanding, for, for those of intellect, of أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ So we should make this strong intention when we start reciting the Holy Quran that I'm not only uttering the words of the Holy Quran, I'm not only uttering the speech of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the words of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm actually reciting an address from whom, from Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to whom, to me, to every single one of us. When we recite the Holy Quran, we should 
make that clear. This would help us contemplate over the verses of the Holy Quran because the Holy Quran is a message from the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to every single one of us. It is not just uh, a piece of poem to just utter or a nasheed or a song. No, it is a message. It is an address from Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to every single one of us. And by doing so, the reward will be multiplied. The recitation of the Holy Quran has a great reward. But when you recited it, the way the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to recite it is, then your reward will be greatly multiplied as it is a fulfillment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commandment. As I said, the spirit of the Holy Quran and the spirit rather of the fasting also goes beyond the physical activities, goes beyond um, abstaining from eating, drinking, because uh, fasting in its fiqh definition, in its juristic definition is to abstain from eating, drinking, sexual intercourse, and all prohibitions from the eyes of the dawn till the sun of set. And from this defini definition, you come to realize that fasting is not only abstaining from food and drink and sex, it's also abstaining from all prohibitions, which includes all sins, all form of sins, all forms of disobedience to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when we read the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we find indications that fasting could be nullified, could get invalidated by the major sins. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, al tufattar al-sa'im wa tanqud al wudun al backbiting, tufattar al-sa'im nullifies the fast break one's fast وتنقض الوضوء also it makes one's ablution null and void and in another narration or reported to us by Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عند Prophet peace be upon him was quoted as saying من لم يدع قول الزور والعمل به فليس لله حاجة في أن يدع طعامه وشرابه uh, who, who doesn't abandon zur, false witness and false statement and acting upon these false statements and lies Allah is in no need for, his, for him leaving his fast and for him leaving his food and his drink Allah does, doesn't want all of, of that if he is on sin, if he keeps on sinning. So fasting is not just uh, abstaining from eating and drinking, it is also abstaining from all sorts of sin. So fasting the month of Ramadan is a spiritual school. It is actually a spiritual school to gain a spiritual renewal and to gain, to be spiritually refreshed, to ponder over a previous life, especially those of us, and each of us has committed sins, especially those of us who lived the life of sin, who lived the life of disobedience to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They should rethink their relation with the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They should make a strong intention and a strong commitment that they are gonna start a new life. A life full of obedience, a life full of acts of worship, a life full of rituals, a life full of that which gets us closer to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a life full of that activities and rituals and acts that draw us nearer to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
by doing so we get really closer to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the purpose of fasting this is the purpose of fasting which we state in Arabic as a taqwa we call it in Arabic a taqwa a taqwa in its simplest definition is to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to do is to abide by the commandments and teachings of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to abandon on the other hand anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited and prevented us from doing. So this is the simple definition of a taqwa which is the ultimate purpose of fasting. If I am to summarize the whole spirit of fasting in a single word, I would call it a taqwa. So a taqwa is to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to do and to abandon what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited. A taqwa is to fear God. Many scholars defined taqwa as God's consciousness to be conscious of God, to be aware of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever you do, you make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala present in your heart and in your man, mind. And this is the highest levels of Iman. It is called Al-Ihsan. Uh, in a narration uh, reported to us in Musnad al-Imam al-Rabi'a by Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu ta'ala an the Prophet peace be upon him says Al-Ihsan an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah fa'in lam takun tarahu fa'innahu yarak Al-Ihsan this highest and great uh, virtues of Iman is to worship Allah as if you are seeing and viewing Allah and if you don't in reality see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then he sees you so al-ihsan this high level of iman is and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if Allah is before you as if you see Allah and in fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing you and by doing so you will be conscious of Allah you will be aware of Allah. You will get and attain God's, God's consciousness. And this is when I say this is the ultimate purpose of fast. This is not my big claim. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated in the very verse, in the very first verse in which the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made fasting an obligation for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who have believed, kutiba alaykum al-sayam, kama kutiba ala al-ladheena man qablikum, al-alakum tattahoon. Fasting has been prescribed upon you, as it was prescribed upon those who came before you, so that you may attain piety. لعلكم تتقون. See the conclusion of this verse. The conclusion of this ver verse states the purpose of fasting. So it is not about abstaining from food, drink, sex, and so on and so forth. Rather, it is for an ultimate purpose. That is to attain piety. Yes, to attain piety, to attain righteousness, is to attain piety and to attain Righteousness. Yes. So that to attain piety and to attain righteousness. So we need to strive to achieve this goal, piety and righteousness. And um, when you look at the verse, it is interesting, the wording of the verse. The Almighty says, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed upon those who came before you. The word prescribe, when a doctor writes you a prescription, this reminds us of something, of medicine or medication. So it, as if there is an indication here that our body is sick and weak 
our heart is sick and weak and the medication and the cure and the treatment for that is by fasting so fasting is a medication for the soul fasting is a medication for the heart fasting when it is done properly the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it would give it results it would cure the heart it would purify the soul and it also even cures the body so mutasihu as the prophet peace be upon him said fast you get fit fast you get healthy so this this is the ultimate i would say purpose of fasting besides that fasting is a time a station to stop over to refuel and to recharge fasting is a transit as if you are in a, 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 a transit uh, flight at an airport so you are there just for a short period of time and to change your flight to another direction so should be the believer he should direct himself to another direction from a direction of sin and and uh, making short falls being uh, doing for choice when it comes to his uh, worship to another direction to a direction of fulfillment to a direction of complete obedience to almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so fasting helps us rethink our relation with almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to renew our pledge with almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our ahd al ahd that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken from us this covenant that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken from us from long long before we were born this was indicated in a great verse in surah al-a'raf wa'id akhada wa'id akhada rabbuka min bani adam min buhurihim dhurriyatahum wa ashhadahum ala anfusihim alastu bi rabbikum qalu bala shahidna an taqulu inna kunna an hadha wa fi so almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, telling us in this verse that there was a covenant and promise from us to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala long before we were born to worship Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So fasting is uh, a time to renew this commitment, to strengthen our ties with our Creator, to make the due worship an obligation to our Maker and to our Creator because we are immense in the favors and bounties of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the best way to thank Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to fulfill his obligations. This is the best thing that draws you closer to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a great hadith, it's called a divine narration, hadith Qudusi, a divine hadith. Uh, in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, says that the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّ افْتَرَطْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ My servant will find nothing better than the things that I made him, I made it obligatory upon him to get him closer to me. وَمَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهِ And my servant will keep on getting closer to me by doing the virtuous and voluntary deeds until I love him. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ كُنْتُ سَمْعَهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ And when I love him, I became his hearing with which he hears. وَبَصَرَهُ الَّذِي يُبْصَرُ بِهِ It is the eyesight with which he sees وَيَدَهُ الَّتِي يَبْطَشُ بِهَا his, I would become his hand with which he strikes وَرِجْلَهُ الَّتِي يَمْشِي بِهَا I become his leg with which he walks which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make tawfiq for him when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs your eyes your eyes, your hearing, your heads 
and your hands, your foot. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would guide you to, to the best walks of this life. So we should uh, strive to achieve this ultimate goal of piety. So and Ramadan is also a time behind uh, the personal benefits. Also Ramadan is a time to remember the poor and the needy. There are people out there who are starving out of hunger, who are starving, starving out of thirst throughout the year, but we don't feel them. And Ramadan is a reminder. If, we, if you feel now you are, that you are hungry and you are thirst, then remember there are people who have this feeling throughout the year. And when you have the same feeling as theirs, then this encourages you to be generous, to donate to the poor and the needy. And this is not only a, a claim or just a personal invitation from myself. It's also a practical sunnah from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he would be met by Gibril, he would be generous. According to the narration, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس. سيدة عائشة, may Allah be pleased with her, says, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was the generous of men. And وكان أجود ما يكون في رمضان. And he would be as generous as he can during the month of Ramadan when he is met by the angel Gabriel, peace be upon them both. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he is met by Jibreel, he was more generous than the, the wind which blows freely. Imagine the wind that blows freely, non-stop. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was even during Ramadan more generous than this wind. So it is an invitation to myself and to you to be generous in the month of Ramadan, following the footsteps of the Prophet, peace be upon him. In, if we are truly believers in the Prophet, peace be upon him, then we should follow his footsteps. The, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a condition in order for our love to be true, to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفَرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ If you true, if you are truly believing in Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you. يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفَرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ And he will forgive your sins. So Ramadan, it is a time it is about forgiving, to be forgiven and to forgive others, to be forgiven, to seek forgiveness from, from Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also to forgive your fellow Muslims, your fellow brothers, your fellow sisters, your fellow humans. So it is a time because the spirit is high during the months of Ramadan. So you need to capitalize on this asset, on this spiritual asset. You need to make use of this spiritual asset when your spirits and your spiritual emotions are high, you need to make use of that by going beyond only the personal spiritual benefits, by making donations to the poor and the needy, by looking after the members of the community who are perhaps marginalized, who are deprived, who are less fortunate. You need to look after that. So Ramadan is about charity. Ramadan is about donation. Ramadan is about mercy. Ramadan is about loving others. It is not only about loving yourself and your just uh, immediate close family members. It's also about caring about the whole Muslim community. And this is 
a lesson from our great prophet, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Ramadan is also a school to self-discipline and to self-restraint. If you are able, when we notice that the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mainly prohibited during the daylight of Ramadan, they are originally per permissible. Uh, uh, eating, drinking, having sex with one spouse, these are all permissible and in fact they are encouraged and advised. Uh, so if we are able to abstain from these permissible things, then that means we are able to refrain, to abstain, to give up all bad habits, all impermissible uh, practices and habits. For example, if one is used to smoke uh, before Ramadan, then Ramadan is a time to change. If one used to, for example, um, abandon the visit of his family, one of his family, he is cutting ties with a member of his family, or a colleague or a workmate, then Ramadan is a time to change to another direction. So Ramadan is about self-discipline, about taming and training yourself. Ramadan is about patience. When your uh, physical organs tell you to drink and eat out of thirst and hunger, and the heart controls everything, he says to this organ, stop until it is the right time. Stop because you fear Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stop because you want to attain piety, which is the purpose of fasting. Then you are attaining patience. Then you are patient. Ramadan is about dua. Ramadan is, as Ramadan is just the, fa the month of fast, the month of patience, the month of the Quran, it is also the month of dua. And we find the indication to this meaning in the verses which um, made the fasting obligatory, which detail the rules and regulations of fasting. We find a distinguished verse amidst these verses that is only specified for dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, among the verses of fast, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشَدُونَ When my servants ask you, O oh Muhammad, about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am near. It is interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, tell them I am near. No, he replied to us, by himself, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Although the Prophet, peace be upon him, was asked, but who answered this question? Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. He didn't tell to the Prophet, when they ask you about me, tell them I am near. No, he said, I am near. So Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is answering our question himself. This is a reference to the closeness, to the extent, to the degree of how close Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to us. So we need to capitalize in this. We need to strive by making dua during this month, especially during sujood, because we are praying, the, uh, we are performing the prayer, the night prayer, taraweeh prayer, the night prayer. We shouldn't neglect doing dua during sujood. أقرب ما يكون العبد إلى ربه وهو ساجد the nearest position in which the servant uh, is close to his Lord is when he is prostrating, when he is sagging. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, commanded us to do specifically dua in sujood. If you are doing voluntary uh, act, then do dua uh, in sujood. If you are praying, performing voluntary prayer, then make use of your sujood. Do dua in your sujood. The Prophet, peace be upon him, فَقَمِنٌ أَنْ يُسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ It is more likely for your dua during sujood to be replied and to be answered and to be responded by Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I don't want to prolong too much 
I don't want to hold you and, and to take much more from your precious time. I promised uh, Engineer Saeed to be brief and to be straight to the point and to try to make my presentation short. And so I think there is a second part for the talk for your Q and A. So please feel free if there is anything that I can help with you. Maybe you have some additions and questions, discussion. Feel free to do so, please. Thank you very much, Sheikh Al-Mu'tasim. Barakallah feek. Alfi Bizan Hasanatak, inshallah. Amen. The lecture is great. Appreciated what's been all the information given to us and emphasizes on some point, especially the dua as well as the praying at night and during dua during the sujood. These things, really, we have to remind ourselves. Correct. Thank you very much. Correct. Uh, correct. Unless unless um, we make them into practice, we wouldn't benefit them. They would true, be true. only they would only be theories, and they will just go away. So unless we it, it is it is a holy a holy month, and everybody has to remind himself correct. what he's done and what he's going to do in the in the coming. Of course, month. in the, the second month, half. Inshallah. Yes, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> Amin, now the floor is for the question. If you have uh, my colleagues, let yes, us go. Can I have a question? Three questions. Yeah, Dr. Ahmed, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Sheikh Matasun, for a very good lecture. Jazakallah khair, inshallah. Amin. Allah, this is in your mizan, bi'Allah ta'ala. Sheikh, I feel myself whenever I'm doing siyam, alhamdulillah, even Ramadan or outside Ramadan, the concentration and the focus while doing my work or reading whatever is uh, bitter or is, mm, is bitter during the siyam yani. where yes. we think that uh, uh, we sometimes when we are i mean uh, fasting we might think that we have got tired whatever yes but in myself i feel even the uh, i mean it is opposite uh, yes. what do you think why is that uh, I think there is... I have to say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah. But it will be kind of sharing our experiences with the Siyam. True, true. And uh, I need some kind of explanation in parallel with your lecture. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think it is a misconception to believe that fast uh, or Ramadan is uh, the month of laziness. In fact, there is a narration that is not authentic at all. No Musa'in Ibadah. No the sleep of the fasting persons is a form of worship no uh -huh. it's not it's a, not not a form of worship it's a form of worship to the extent that helps you to worship almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but yes. to voluntary uh, spend your daylight of ramadan sleeping that's at all reprehensible that is at all uh, that is something dislike we shouldn't do and i should draw your attention to the fact that this narration is an authentic narration. It's a weak narration. And uh, I remember our Sheikh, Sheikh Sa'id Al-Qannubi, may Allah preserve him, and uh, mentioned their narrator who narrated this narration. His nickname was Al-Ruqadi. Uh, <laughs> and the, I mean the narration, uh, not necessarily this narration, it yeah. might be another narration actually and he said uh, the ruqad might have uh, busy him from um, uh, remembering the sunnah of the prophet muhammad peace be upon him or memorizing the sunnah of the prophet muhammad peace be upon him uh, going back to the question when we look at our islamic history we find ramadan is a month of victory uh, when we look at fath mecca the conquest of mecca it was in Ramadan. Uh, uh, it was in Ramadan. When Jerusalem was liberated, it was in Ramadan. When Mecca was uh, conquered and liberated, it was in Ramadan. Al Qadisiyah was in Ramadan. And modern day wars, uh, they happened also in Ramadan. So Ramadan is a time of work. And Ramadan is a time of of uh, of activity what do you feel of uh, being active during the day of ramadan is shared by many people it's not i think a personal feeling or experience 
it is something felt by I think uh, most Muslims. Yes, it might be hard during the first two, three days of Ramadan for those who are not used to fasting, for those who, who didn't train themselves uh, over the past uh, few months or weeks. Yes, it might be quite difficult at the beginning, especially those who are addicted to, for example, drinking tea or coffee until the body adapts to a new situation. So um, it, it is a misconception to believe that Ramadan is a month of inactivity. The true is the opposite. I, I can assure you and confirm that. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. After I have to leave, I have a lecture in about five minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there any question? We are inviting the guests. The guests, especially if you have some questions or some discussion, please come. Huh? I do have a couple of questions, may I ask? Mm, sure, so most will come. Uh, and, and tell the, my colleagues if they've got something to add. Uh, my question is, how many times our Prophet Muhammad, he, he did fast during his uh, life? That's the first question. Mm. And the second one regarding uh, heavy work people do, uh, especially, for example, in construction, house construction during summer. Mm -hmm. uh, shall they some of them they say it is hard it's difficult to continue fasting and i have to work and blah blah as you say and on the other hand people they feel guilty if they don't fast mm -hmm. so what's your comment on those things? um the fasting was made obligatory in the second year of al hijra in the month of shaban of the second year of al hijra all the way to the Prophet's peace be upon him demise or death in the 11th year of al hijra So I believe he fasted for nine consecutive uh, years, so nine months of Ramadan. But uh, uh, there was an obligation of fast before Ramadan. It was the day of Ashura until it was ob uh, uh, abrogated or replaced by the month of Ramadan, but Ramadan uh, still remains a virtuous day to be fasted. Um, your second question, please look but, up. Uh, people who work in the construction and under mm. the sun, is, uh, do they have to do the fast and the work they do? It is really hard. Is there they have to pay something to compensate for fasting? Yes. Some of religious people say yes. Some others, I, I don't know. But people are still. As I mm. said, they feel guilty if they don't fast, but on the other hand, they have to do work. I believe, uh, especially I'm talking about my country, Oman, those who are working in construction, most of them are uh, from the expat community, and most of them are travelers. So to begin with, fasting is not obligatory uh, this Ramadan or as long as they are on travel. So they can, if it is too hard, if it is too much to fast and they cannot take a leave during the month of Ramadan, then um, uh, they can break the fast with the intention that they make, up, they make it up when it is possible. For example, if it is uh, possible in winter time, even if they are still working, then they should make it up in the winter time. It's highly recommended to make up the fast before the following Ramadan comes, before the following Ramadan. So you don't, you don't postpone more than one Ramadan. You only, you are only postponing. You are allowed to postpone only one Ramadan, unless there is also another uh, necessity to postpone it to another to Ramadan. Otherwise, one should fast. If he doesn't uh, fast and he is a traveler and uh, then he can break the fast and the Holy Quran makes this concession فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر whoever among you is sick or on travel فعدة من أيام أخر let him uh, break and make up these days uh, in the future Okay. So this is a concession. In, in our countries, for example, in 
uh, wars uh, hot uh, like for example in Iraq they shouldn't yes. because they are not uh, traveling yes they yes yes I, but uh, on the other hand they should not ruin themselves they should not ruin if they reach a degree when it is unbearable they should save themselves and um, uh, by us saying a traveler the definition the definition of travel obviously this is an issue of dispute between the jurists and scholars of islam but for us uh, here it is adopted in oman if you leave uh, for example your home place uh, for by uh, uh, 12 kilometers to Farsakhain, according to the narration of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then you are considered a traveler. So if one, uh, according... Sheikh, Sheikh, for the traveler, let me say, if you are leaving your home to another place, hmm. let me say, go to Masqa. For how hmm. many days is considered if you are travelers? Uh, as I... days, three days, yes. or, or the whole time you are living hmm. in, in Masqa? Yes, for as I stated earlier, uh, this is an issue of dispute between the scholars of the, the different schools of law. What it is adopted here in Oman is that as long as you are on travel, then you are giving the rules and regulations of the traveler. And um, yes, some scholars uh, specify that with four days, so if you are intended to exceed four days, then you are giving the rules of residence. This is a valid viewpoint. This is a valid opinion. We don't uh, dispute if one feels comfortable following this opinion, then uh, that is uh, a valid opinion as well. But we go, we adopted the other opinion for two reasons. Uh, the first of which that um, the practice of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he went to Mecca al mukarramah he conquered Mecca al mukarramah he stayed there according to the least narrations, uh, 15 days, and he would shorten and his prayer. When he went to Tabuk, he spent something around 20 days. Uh, the proofs and evidence didn't stay, stay a particular period of time after which one are, is not given the rules of um, uh, of uh, travel, Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, stayed in Adar began for 18 months and he would always shorten his uh, prayer. Uh, but as I said, uh, this is a flexible issue. Uh, as long as the rules of travel is applied to you, then you are allowed to break your fast. Okay, thank Allah you. Knows. Thank you. Allah knows best. Is there any other questions? Contribution? Sheikh Mu'tasim, I found one of your books about uh, uh, Ibadi articles in Ibadi studies. Mm -hmm. So yes. uh, if you can give briefly introduction about uh, Ibadi, uh, mm. uh, Madhab Ibadi. Uh, I Ibadi. think this is, this is a follow-up question to the previous question. Mm -hmm. because I referred that uh, what is adopted with us, I meant in the Ibadi school of law, uh, in the Ibadi fiqh. So regarding if you are interested in knowing about uh, Ibadism in brief, so Ibadis uh, or the Ibadi school of law is one of the earliest schools uh, of law in Islam. In fact, if we compare it to the mainstream uh, four schools of law, then we find Ibadis is the earliest because the founder of the Ibadi school of law uh, was born Gabir bin Zayd at late, at latest uh, he was born in 21 year, in the 21 of Al Hijra. According to some narration, he was born 18 and he passed away in 18 of Al Hijra. While the four. Uh, Three. 93, Dr. Uh, 93, did I say? Uh, okay, 93, if I said something else, I was confused. Uh, so he passed away 93 of al uh, Hijra, Imam Gabir bin Zayd, and uh, most and all uh, Imams of the other schools of law uh, just came after Imam Jabir bin Zayd, Abu Hanifa, 
then followed by the Imam Malik bin Anas, then followed by the Imam Shafi'i, and followed by the Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. And all of them are great scholars and great Imams who followed the Daleel, and they have their own valid opinions. But uh, you know, these schools have developed uh, in early century, centuries of Islam. Regarding Ibadism, as I said, uh, it is uh, the founder, I would say, the spiritual founder of the Ibad school of law was Gaber bin Zaid, as I said earlier, and he was born in Farq, the village or the city of Farq in Nizwa, where the university is near, to where the university is located. And um, they were known of Ibadis after uh, one of the followers of the school, who, uh, whose name is uh, Abdullah ibn Ibad. Uh, may Allah be pleased with him. And Abdullah ibn Ibad was not the spiritual leader, was not the founder of the group, but uh, the Umayyads, the opponents of Ibadis, named this school after Abdullah ibn Ibad because, because he was the political spokesman, I would say, of the group because he belonged to a very strong tribe that is the tribe of Bani Tamim and the tribe of Bani Tamim was very much strong in Iraq at that time so Ibadis nominated him to be the political spokesman of the group because the Umayyads uh, couldn't have harmed him because of his strong tribe the tribe of Bani Tamim behind him Otherwise, uh, we don't find in any Ibadi literature or book of fiqh any juristic viewpoint attributed to Abdullah ibn Ibad, which means he was not a religious authority or jurisprudence of fiqh authority. He was following only the commandment of Gabir ibn Zayd, radiallahu ta'ala, and, and the students of Gabir ibn Zayd. But the Umayyads named the whole group after him because he was the one who is debating with the Umayyad rulers, especially Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. He has uh, some arguments up to this, surviving up to this day with the Umayyad ruler Abdul Malik bin Marwan. And at the beginning, Ibadis didn't acknowledge this attribution to, uh, to Abdullah ibn Ibad because they said simply Abdullah ibn Ibad is just one of the followers of this group and the spiritual leader, religious leader, the religious authority was Gabir ibn Zayd. So they didn't acknowledge this for almost three centuries. The very first place in which the word Ibadi is found in an Ibadi literature is at the end of the third century in a book written by the Algerian or the uh, North African scholar Amrus Ibn Fath and Nafusi. And that's why the true founder of the school is uh, Gaber ibn Zayd. And all, actually, uh, Abdullah ibn Ibad, Gaber ibn Zayd, and the other Imams of the other schools of law, they all follow the Daleel. They all follow the proof from the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, uh, Sunnah of the Prophet of Allah and the Book of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, so um, there is an as association. This is one of the misconceptions uh, that Ibadis have suffered over the course of history is the ascription and attribution of Ibadis to a group, an extreme group called Karijites. This association is not true at all and i wrote a paper i'm not gonna this is not the topic of this discussion and this session so i'm not gonna uh, to elaborate on this um, i would refer their listeners and the viewers who are interested to pursue on this topic to read an article i read it is a published article about the distinction between ibadis and car guides it was published in Journal of Islamic Thoughts and Civilization for those who are interested in reading more in this topic.
and Allah knows the best. Shukran, Sheikh. Shukran. Uh, still, we are uh, opening the questions for uh, if you have some questions or discussions. Please come. Our students, our colleagues, and our guests from our university also will come. You can uh, raise your questions. Just to un unmute your microphone and raise your question. And this is a good news that the lecture was uh, clear yeah. and uh, nobody has an objection. <laughs> Then, then in this case, we have to thank uh, Sheikh Al Muhtasim. My pleasure. And, uh, Jazakallah khair. Sayyam Abdul, inshallah. Amin, inshallah. Kul sana wa anta tayyib. Inshallah. Kul aam wa anta bkhair. Thank you again, Dr. Saeed Elek, for organizing this uh, lecture. And we hope to have another lecture with different topics, not just Ramadan, maybe on inshallah. religious, but maybe there will be some dispute. Regarding okay. some 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 issues, everybody yes. think about something. One thing's uh -huh. come to my mind: Why not Ibad is still in in Iraq? Many uh -huh. of these uh, uh -huh. schools, many of them, yes, in different. Iraq, yeah. maybe in, in new comings in 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 future, nobody knows. But yes. Ibad none, which is being established in, in Iraq. Correct, correct. But which is why, the first one? Which is first one, as you said? Yes, yes, yes. Why and not? Still? We should dedicate a session to this topic. Yeah, inshallah. 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 Well, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you all. Shukran, Sheikh Mu'atasim. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Rafna. Shukran, also, to the Zamala, all of them, and to the guests, also, who are present from outside. Shukran, to you. Shukran, to you. Shukran, to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.